emphasized a foundation principle that we are created in the image of God. That is the most important idea in all of human history. We are created in the image of God. That signifies that we have a burden, a burden of relationship. We are born for relationship. And the relationship involves norms or principles. Just as God is a God of love, God is also a God of law, of order, of morals, of principles, of ideals, of ethics. So we have the burden of relationship based on principles or ethics. And it's a systematic burden because the relationship with God has meaning and value in terms of how we relate to each other, how we relate to the environment, how we create meaning within ourselves. So, for example, two weeks from now, we'll talk about a theory of education, principle of education. We each have strengths within us that have to be drawn out. The very meaning of educare, to draw out, means to educate. We are drawing out the strengths within us and in relationship to us. We all live in relationship. Consequently, it's necessary to see the systemic nature of relationship. So when we talk about sustainability, much of what is written about sustainability involves material kinds of issues. In other words, the, the classic definition of sustainability a, a number of years ago, the United Nations Brundtland Report spoke at, defined sustainability as the meeting the needs of the present, I shouldn't have said myself, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations. I'm not sure we need it. That you find that quote used almost always when it comes to environmental problems, when it comes to energy efficiency, things of that sort. Even the concept of reduce, reuse, recycle, that's almost become a cliche in communities and in various organizations, largely involves material things that basically it's a concern for environmental sustainability. Pollution, greenhouse gases, global warming. Obviously, these are major kinds of problems. But if we look at these problems from just a material point of view, in many ways, they're unsolvable. We can make progress, we can do many good things, but it often does not solve the ethical, the moral problems of relationship. The principal point of view of sustainability is that we have to look not only at the physical nature of the environment and our behavior in terms of the environment, but also many other dimensions in terms of our relationship to each other and the degree to which we fulfill our own potential. Ultimately, it's the burden of love. To have a sustainable environment, ultimately we have to love the environment. But we can't love the environment unless we've developed the love within ourselves. And then the burden, of course, is not only to love the world, but to love each other. Those are the basic principles of the great Western heritage and religion. So concern for environmental sustain sustainability from a unification point of view is that the problems are not just environmental. There are social justice issues, poverty, homelessness, affordable housing, many things that involve the social issues, which even if we can solve to a large degree these material problems, they don't get solved if we have people who are suffering in poverty without homes, without adequate kind of housing. The cultural issues involve lack of community, isolation. Many of you have probably read Robert Put Putnam's book, fellow professor at Harvard, called Bowling Alone. The thesis of his book is that more and more people are not bowling in teams, we're not relating in groups, but rather we look for isolated experiences of pleasure. Consequently, there's a fundamental breakdown within ourselves because we need each other. Human beings need community. We can either have bad community or good community, just like we can have bad love as well as good love, bad relations as well as good relations. The question is, how do we take the norms, the principles, the values, the ideals that guide us 
on one level to other levels. So also economic issues. What do we manufacture and how do we design and build what humans need? The whole question of reduce, reuse, and recycle obviates, does not come to deal with the whole question of designing things from the get-go so that they can go back either into the material cycle or somehow into the moral cycle. The, the whole concept of design is very important in terms of dealing even with the physical problems. Do we think from the very beginning of how what we design will impact not only the physical environment, but impact others? The people who do the designing have to be concerned about the quality of life with the workers, the quality of life in community. To what degree in what we're designing does it impact others? You know, the law of unintended consequences is very much at work here. In other words, you can come up with a beautiful design for a physical object that saves energy, but yet isolates people. In the whole concept of suburban living, we can live in beautiful homes in the suburbs, but the amount of energy, even if it's an energy efficient house, if it's in the suburbs and there are no walkable communities, and older people are locked away in their homes so that they don't have a place as, as often in Europe, you have squares where people can sit down in a, in a plaza, talk to other people, look at young people, play cards, chess, whatever. You can have a beautiful energy efficient home, but if it doesn't take into consideration the quality of life, even our physical life, now more and more, obviously we live in, the Ber in Berkeley in the Bay Area, the whole idea of bicycling and using our physical body for health is very important. But often in building communities, we don't take into consideration the physical well-being of, of the person. One of the people in our church uh, was, a, for many years, the uh, traffic engineer in Palo Alto, Carl Stoffel. Carl Stoffel's job at the beginning, many years ago, was taking traffic from point A to point B in the, most, in the quickest possible way, without obstruction. Now, the very nature of traffic design in Palo Alto is, how can we ensure that people can walk and not be obstructed by cars? How can we take into consideration bicycle paths for the well-being of people? So the designers who come together in that city are not only the traffic designers, the engineers, but there are people who involve the nonprofit organizations, people in churches, people who work with other community groups dealing with mental health, physical health. It's a systemic kind of process rather than thinking moving cars from A to B in the quickest possible way. It's a different way of looking at reality, which is, from a unification point of view, the true nature of sustainability. So the unification view of sustainability involves an integrated systemic approach to problems, not merely a technical approach. How do we create a quality of life that integrates the physical, the social, and the spiritual needs of people? We're not just physical beings, we're not just social beings, but why are we truth seekers, beauty seekers, love seekers? That's our spiritual, or if you will, a divine nature. If you look at human beings, we all like beautiful music. We all look for truthful things, give us energy and creativity. We play soccer so that the body can move in beautiful ways. All these things are our desire. It's that physically we want a stand of excellence. Morally, or in terms of music and the arts, we want standards of excellence. That song, that really is a great song. I didn't realize that you wrote that song. That's a beautiful song that needs to be heard by many people. It's an uplifting song. It's a moving song where we want to move our bodies. Like Bishop Jackson and I, he almost affected me there. I was ready to go. But uh, so the current ethic, in other words, the, the means by which we deal with our burden of relationship, and it's a burden. Isolation, people cannot live in isolation. They can't live in fragmented relations. They can't live in relations where they're exploited or abused by others. Human beings, in the current ethic, often focus on radical individualism. As long as I'm making it, as long as I'm doing good, as long as I've got money in my pocket, I've got it made. And, uh, you know, it's nice to have one of Tesla's new cars and you're going to bomb around. And, but there are problems. We're present-oriented people, largely speaking. These are generalizations, but generalizations that have great truth to them. Often we want more. You know, we, uh, I often talk about, in education, the goal is the classical virtues, temperance, prudence, justice, fortitude, faith, hope, and love, 
Temperance means self-control. Prudence making, means making good choices. Uh, courage. Uh, uh, all of these are the virtues that actually the, the, the classical writers were right on in terms of how we have to behave as human beings to realize our full value. Faith, hope, and love, the Christian virtues, give us meaning in life. How do you learn to love? What do you love? How large is your love? These are the challenges of life. It never ends. When you're a teenager, you think of love in one way. When you are older, you think of love in a very different way. How do you develop the kind of love that is the most fulfilling love? These are issues that are very important in terms of developing sustainability. So a unification ethic emphasizes the interdependence of community and the environment. Community, again, meaning not only social community, but spiritual community. We hunger for what gives us truth, what gives us beauty, what gives us love. That's the spiritual dimension of who we are as human beings. If we don't get that, we fail as human beings. We live in isolation. We feel a sense of alienation, estrangement. We feel that sense of aloneness that's not a positive aloneness. One can be alone and yet feel fulfilled. One can be terribly alone and forgotten in Manhattan. You know, I'm going home to my city, by the way. Okay, future-oriented. In other words, the unification ethic is future-oriented, not just present-oriented, in terms of not just the environment, but in terms of relationships. How do we build quality relationships over a lifetime in community with others? And it's value-based rather than consumption-based. You know, the, the Pope talks about the great problem in the world is that we are cons the, the culture is consuming, endlessly consuming, and yet we never feel fulfilled. It's like we have a tapeworm within ourselves <laughs> rather than a value-based consumption where whatever you have, you're grateful for it. Gratitude is a religious virtue. It's a secular virtue as well, but it's hard to be grateful when you're looking for the next thing that you can get. Uh, I, I've shared how I've only been in Walmart twice in my life, and both times I've just been overwhelmed. It's like a crippling feeling. You know, you go in there and it's just endless. How can you be a religious person in Walmart? I don't know, you know. That would be a good test if somebody's religious or not. Then the congregation to Walmart and see how they do. Uh, it's, it really is overwhelming with things and stuff that we have. All the latest iPod 2, iPod 3, hoo-ha, you know, whatever it is. Samsung's got this one, the Microsoft is going under if they don't come up with something better, and all these things. What's next? You know, we can hardly wait. So we, need the, we have a need for a normative view of who we are and how we must live in our relationships. Normative means what are the principles that guide relationship in each of these different levels. And we have to then motivate each sector of society to work in relationship to others. A book came out recently called The Revolution of Cities. And it involves the private sector, the public sector, independent sector working together. Private sector businesses, public sector government. Government has a real role. Businesses have a real role in creating wealth. You can't just get wealth, you have to create wealth. For many years I was the senior director of the Global Economic Action Institute. We went all around the world. Every country knows how to spend money. Very few countries know how to create wealth. So they look for foreign aid, and the foreign aid goes to governments rather than to, business or to businesses or to others. And the independent sector are the nonprofit groups, the churches, the organizations that deal with social issues, spiritual issues, things of that sort. So when anything is decided upon, the example, let's say, of Palo Alto with getting traffic from A, A to B, you have to bring in elements of all of these different sectors so they can look at what is the quality of health that will come from this decision? How do our policies follow from certain principles? So it's necessary in any situation to bring in all of the elements that will impact the social, the spiritual, and the individual well-being of people. So that's the significant of that, the normative framework that is the unification principle. So areas where the unification view of sustainability can lead to practical policies. We always want to know, never mind these lectures, what does it mean practically? How does this actually, what policies follow from this? You know, policy, follows from purpose and says the unification view identifies first principles, the one about the most significant of which is we are created in the image of God and we are burdened by relationship. We are forced to make meaning. Even in a concentration camp, you know Frankel's book, The Search for Meaning, the fellow was in the concentration camp and he saw people die before they even were killed, murdered, 
they died spiritually first. They lost all meaning. The meaning that Frankel had was his remembrance of love, the love of his wife who was in another concentration camp. But the power of love allowed him to serve others and live and sustain his life and actually become a psychiatrist and offer a whole school of psychiatry involved with that book, The Man's Search for Meaning. So the nature of the person has divine value which needs to be drawn out in relation to the environment and others. So in terms of our policies, we can have sprawl or the compact cities. Waste and isolation versus the possibility of community. One of the nice things that happened here, if you want to, I don't know if you know the Fruitvale uh, Transit Village, where they did get together lots of people in the community before they built the village. They were going to build a parking lot. This is one of the stops on the BART. They were going to build a huge parking lot so that when people came on the, off the BART, or when they stopped in the morning, they would park their car and they'd get on the BART. The people in the community said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> We've got to work together on this. So they built, you know, there's a library and there's a children's center and a number of things so that when people are going shopping in, the, in that area or they're getting on the BART, there are many other activities that can, they can participate in. It doesn't have to be a dead garage. It can be a life su supporting element of a good community. The automobile dependent city versus the pedestrian city city. We can create streets for play, conversation, exercise, beauty, farmers markets. We have some in Berkeley, but as I've mentioned in previous lectures, Berkeley is the most radical city, city in America, and there's no plaza where people can just sit down and talk to each other or play chess or whatever. It can change if we have a different point of view. Green design, green business, green building, we're doing pretty well with that. So in terms of our material awareness, we are no, we're getting more and more knowledge of how to deal with building in an eco ecologically sustainable way. In fact, at Merritt College, they have a self-reliant house where they got, it's actually a demonstration house where everything from the rainwater to the natural plants that are, that are native to this area. If you want a real quick education, check out the uh, self-reliant house at uh, Merritt College. The uh, affordable housing and homelessness. Co-housing, Berkeley and Oakland have examples of co-housing. Co-housing involves people who have their own individual living units but there also is a central communal unit where they can cook their dinners together or have en entertainment together, what have you. So Americans need their own space, but they also need to be with others when they choose to do so. So co-housing, housing, if you look into that, has a lot of dynamics that enhance the quality of people's lives in the city. Same thing happened for Tap for Humanity. You know, thank God there are organizations like that that build houses for poor people and count sweat equity as part of the capital. In other words, the people who actually will eventually own the house, the part of the capital that they put down is the amount of hours they put in working on that particular house. And again, there are examples in Oakland. Sustainability and faith communities. Human responsibility for others in the creation is a very old principle. It's the stewardship of the earth. One example that I checked out from reading this very famous book, very big seller all over the world, at least people who know me, called Oakland, California. If you check out, you know, Allen Temple, why has this church become perhaps the largest church in Oakland? They have a community outreach center, an emergency food program for the needy, a free clothing pantry, a community health fair, case management services for people living with AIDS, the Allen Temple Hate Ashbury Recovery Center, a clinical program to assist people recovering from substance abuse. Six alcohol and drug recovery support groups, anger management and domestic violence prevention, classes with over 350 current enrollees, a citizen, senior citizens activity program, a youth sports and recreation program, a tutorial program for youth and, or, and children, a federal credit union, a job information center, three senior citizens complexes totaling 175 complex units, Allen Temple Manor with 24 units of housing for AIDS patients, a family life center, including 22 classrooms, a gymnasium, a dance studio, a library, a computer literacy center, a children's center, and administrative offices, and the Dr. J. Alfred Smith Senior Training Academy offering job training and placement to ex-offenders and the urban poor. If the church at its best is a caring, loving community, a sustainable community, no better example. You even offer Yiddish classes for people who want it. Uh, uh, 
I mean, you wonder why churches grow or any organization grows. They're serving the needs of people, not a need, but the many-sided needs of people. We are many-sided, and we need people to attend to our needs. When people are not attending to our needs, we're hurting. And our purpose is to heal. The sustainable principle is ultimately a healing principle. We need, we need to heal the earth, we need to heal each other, and we need to heal ourselves. It's like in marriage, you know, when you get married, yeah, you're looking what something you get from your partner, what you need to be looking at, what are you going to do to heal your partner, to give love to your partner? If you look for something you're gonna get, you're gonna be in trouble. And that's what often romance is about. You know, if I only find the right one, I'll just be so happy. I won't have to do anything at all, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'll just be loved. Well, it doesn't work that way. And again, from bowling alone to community renewal, you know, now in many communities they have what's called a third place. It's often Starbucks. In other words, you go from your home to your office, but where do you meet other people where you can just sit down and have a cup of coffee and just chat? You need a third place. And Seattle is an interesting third place where they have, they have a cafe, but also a part of a library, and they have uh, pool tables and, and ping pong tables and other kinds of things where people can just sit. They're not looking for you to buy something and get out. We all need a third place in some way. Character education and sustainability. Without developing good character in young people through service projects, without good character, there is no such thing as sustainability. We can build wonderful things and they'll only be destroyed as we see so much every day all around the world unless we have quality people who are looking for the benefit of their people. The people of good character. So the conclusion is solving problems through an integrated framework of purpose and values. That's essentially how the unification view looks at sustainability. And it, it, it derives, as we've, we've talked about in earlier lectures, from a fundamental ground of first principles. And from those first principles, we can then apply it to different areas of culture. And in two weeks from now, we'll talk about education. But if you have questions now, I'm happy to entertain them, or let's just enjoy each other's company, and then you can talk yourselves about activities that you do that can enhance sustainability or how you feel your, your own point of view about sustainability. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you.